Hello, um, good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Eve Blau, I'm the co-director uh, of the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative, uh, which is the, the sponsor of this event, and I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to tonight's lecture and panel discussion and conversation. Um, this is the culminating event, as many of you probably know, in a three-part series of interventions and workshops that have been taking place uh, over the last couple of days, yesterday and today. Um, on Wednesday morning, there was a workshop uh, called Intervening, um, and some of the speakers uh, tonight were part of that workshop. And earlier today, um, there was another, it was called a talk shop, um, on agendas, which was also um, with uh, representatives from Assemble, and actually most of the speakers tonight, um, and Stephen Zacks and Sandra uh, Branch um, of the Flint Art, Art Project in, in Flint, Michigan. So the, this program as a whole, the, this series of events, um, is intended uh, to offer students and other people who are participating um, hands-on engagement uh, with methods of intervention and critical debates about uh, the agency or how the agency to transform the public realm can be and is seized by artists and architects and curators and critics uh, and various public sector actors. Um, now, before I uh, introduce Stephen Zacks, who is going to moderate tonight's conversation, I just want to say a couple of words about, a few words about the initiative as a whole, the Mellon Initiative. Um, it is a cross-Harvard project, which means it, in, it crosses the various schools uh, at Harvard. It's funded by a four-year grant from the Mellon Foundation. Um, and that grant uh, and the project itself are directed towards exploring interdisciplinary and multimedia methods for studying urban environments, societies, and cultures across the design disciplines, so all of the disciplines that are here, um, but also the humanities and the social sciences. And the idea in all of this is that uh, with a common object of study, the city, we can begin to bridge these disciplinary uh, boundaries and learn from each other and, and uh, have conversations that are really fruitful. So for the last three years, we've been uh, carrying out research and site visits, site travel, um, with faculty and students from different schools across the university. Uh, and we've been focusing that work on four cities, on, on Berlin, Boston, Istanbul, and uh, Mumbai, which we see as, as portals into specific geographies and urban issues. As you, uh, they're very different cities in very different parts of the world. And through that research, actually, and the conversations between these portals, um, we have been opening up a, a very interesting, actually, and, and quite broad field of comparative research across geographies and cultures. So this is our fourth year uh, of the project, and our focus has shifted from site-based research uh, and travel to public programming. Um, we've had an extensive series of conferences and colloquia and workshops and panel discussions. Uh, across the year, um, most of it actually in this semester. Um, and in those events, we've tried to address major themes that have emerged in the course of our research and our work in the portals, but that also extend quite a bit uh, the discussions beyond the portal research. And this is one of those uh, events that really moves quite far uh, beyond uh, the research that we've been doing. and. Um, and very specifically grounded, actually, uh, here. And um, so before I introduce Stephen, I want to thank the Mellon Foundation and the Graduate School of Design, especially Dean uh, Mosin Mustafavi, and also uh, Associate Dean and Interim Chair of Architecture, Michael Hayes, who uh, have been supporting this program. 
And uh, I want to um, thank the organizers, actually, of these events. Eric Ganoyu, who is our program manager, who has sort of masterminded all of these things. Uh, Michael Haggerty, who's been working with him for about a year on this, and Ken Stewart, who has also uh, been working with us in the last little while uh, on this project. The structure for the evening, um, Nato Thompson will present. Uh, then he's, it's going to be, his presentation is going to be followed by a response uh, from Paloma Strelitz and Anthony Engi um, Meacock of Assemble. And then it's going to end with a conversation between uh, Thompson and Assemble that will be moderated uh, by Stephen Zacks. Um, well, and I left out, I'm terribly sorry, Sandra Branch, who's part of that too. Um, OK, Stephen Sachs is a distinguished um, architecture and urban journalist, theorist, and cultural producer uh, who's based in Greenpoint, uh, Brooklyn, um, and is a native of Flint, Michigan. Uh, he received an MA in liberal studies from the New School for Social Research and a BA in Interdisciplinary Humanities from Michigan State University. He served as an editor of, uh, at Metropolis Magazine, and he's received a number of awards uh, from uh, various institutions, including the, the Warhol Foundation, Creative Capital, Art Place, the Graham Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the McDowell Con Colony, and the New York State Council on the Arts and the Newtown Creek Fund. Um, he is also a, uh, the founder and creative director of the Flint Public Art Project, which organizes public events and workshops and temporary installations uh, to inspire residents to reimagine the city, to reclaim vacant and underutilized buildings and lots, and to use innovative tools to steer Flint's long-range planning. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Zacks. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, so uh, as, as you've said, I'm, I'm a journalist covering public art, architecture, and urbanism for Metropolis, currently Architects Newspaper, um, and an organizer of projects meant to impact the public realm. Um, and I'm, um, I'm excited to, to welcome Nato Thompson to discuss um, public art, uh, and urban engagement as a part of the Mellon uh, Urbanism Initiative. Um, uh, curator and now artistic director of Creative Time since 2007, uh, NATO has played a formative role in shaping the field of public art and its engagement with the city. Uh, through his um, annual Creative Time Summit and projects like Pedro Reyes' Democracy, uh, Kara Walker's A Subtlety in the, the former Domino Sugar Factory, uh, Living as Form, a, a survey of socially engaged art questioning the boundary between art and social political action, um, Trevor Peglin's The Last Pictures, which uh, deployed a record of human civilization sent into orbit, um, and Paul Chan's Waiting for Godot in New Orleans, which was an outdoor staging of Beckett as a testimony to the government's failed response to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, he's brought a new order of criticality to art that happens in public places, uh, which can be seen as answering Rosalind Deitch's call for public art that facilitates the expression of social groups excluded from the current organization of the city and help appropriate the city as a vehicle for illuminating contradictions. Uh, previously, Nato worked as a curator at Mass Mocha, where he curated the interventionist art in the social sphere in 2004, which helped articulate the intervention as a defined typology of practice. 
Um, and apart from his role as curator, Nato has been an important voice in the field whose writings have appeared in Book Forum, Freeze, Art Forum, um, Third Text, and Huff Huffington Post. And moreover, he's, he's authored two books, Seeing Power, Art and Activism in the 20th, 21st Century, and most recently, Culture as Weapon, the art of influence in everyday life, which brings insight and urgency to the question of how culture serves as a tool of propaganda and liberation in our political moment. So please welcome Nato Thompson. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. I know you students got homework to do. So yeah, I wrote a book, you know. Just for all of you younger people, I want you to know that if you write a book, you will make no money. <laughs> but it feels good, and feeling good is a good part of life. And you could kind of feel fancy. Um, so this is the book, Culture's Weapon. I want to talk about it because um, I'm going to do two parts of my talk. There are going to be two parts, and we're going to kind of, you just got to bear with me because it's going to feel somewhat schizophrenic, but we'll try to be delicate about it. Um, the first part, I want to go on what this book is about, which is there's a, this book is in some ways trying to talk about public art, perhaps, or culture making in the city, but not made by artists. So it's kind of, you know, we'll get into it, and I'll, but that's the first part. And then the second part is I also just want to talk about some public art projects I've done to just get into the kind of practice of public art, if that's okay. And then we'll have some discussions. Good. So I want to start, and I work at a place called Creative Time. That's our brand. Since we don't have an architectural facility, we are like a guerrilla organization that does public art projects throughout New York and sometimes the US, and we're starting to think about doing work internationally, but when you don't have an actual house that you call your own, your brand becomes your house. All right, that's our brand. All right, so I want to start with something very unorthodox. Let's get it. Where is it? Where are you? No, you're like, <laughs> where are you? Oh, oh here we are. NATO Forward Operating Base Morales Frazier. The outpost of U.S. Marines and French paratroopers is surrounded by Taliban forces. Y'all stand over there, please. John Green is preparing a military mission with an unusual objective. Matt, stand over there for now, please. He and Dr. Matt Arnold are part of a group of civilian social scientists the called the Human Terrain Team, a key to turn the people here away from the Taliban. Uh, Richard's gonna ride in the lab, uh, the cameraman, we're gonna put in uh, the VAB, and you're gonna wanna be... For the next 18 hours, our crew will embed with them as they head outside the secure perimeter and to the front lines of the conflict. on the left, we want the gun on the left, we want you on the back side. Hey, y'all be careful, we'll see you out there, Roger. The chances that the Taliban will attempt to strike this mission are high. They likely know Matt and John's destination, a highly publicized town meeting. A helicopter gunship sweeps the route ahead of the convoy, looking for signs of insurgent activity. On the ground, safely moving the four-person human terrain team requires 30 armed soldiers and seven armored vehicles. But the mission is critical. As part of an effort to win the hearts and minds here, the U.S. funded the building of a paved road. But the plan has backfired. The road construction has bulldozed homes Villagers are now threatening to join the Taliban. The team must somehow make amends. <laughs> Sorry. It's not funny, but it's like, but something went wrong. They built a road and plowed through people's homes that did not endear them. Um, 
So this is a, <laughs> you know, wouldn't you want that voice narrating your wake up in the morning? Um, I don't know when National Geographic got that style. It was a while ago. So this is a, this is a doc around a system called the humor, human terrain system, um, which is, in fact, one of my chapters in the book goes into this quite deeply. It's called The Insurgents. But it um, talks about the moment during the Iraq War where it moved from Donald Rumsfeld's, Donald Rumsfeld's war of shock and awe was its, um, its kind of adage to hearts and minds. And hearts and minds was the brainchild of um, Petraeus who came in. And hearts and minds was a model of fighting warfare that borrowed its entire toolkit from a large trove of information from counterinsurgency models. Um, pulling particularly from the Algeria, the French occupation of Algeria to um, the insurgency of Mao Zedong. And what's interesting about it, and just so you're like, we're talking about public art, why are we dealing with the human terrain system in Iraq and Afghanistan, is because when Petraeus came into the military, what was fascinating to me was they called it the cultural turn in the military, which certainly pricked my ears up. And when I started looking at the methods they used, um, which was, just to say, Petraeus was a big advocate of what we need to do when we go into Mosul, for example, is we need to build roads, build schools, hold tribal council meetings, get to know people. The soldiers need to get out of their tanks and walk the beat and get to become a face in the community. And when I was looking at these methodologies, it occurred to me that it looked strikingly similar to the same kind of tactics I was invested in with public art. And so the, this book is a kind of opportunity to look at methodologies of sociality as, across a wide variety of, discor uh, of, of discourses. So in this particular chapter, I get into the military and the ways in which the hearts and minds approach or the cultural turn I look at that and its methods, and part of it hints at a certain kind of reflection back onto art itself. There are some other chapters, and one of them being, um, which I call the real estate show, and certainly it will be germane to our conversation today, and I'm, I'm sure most of you in this room more, know more about the subject than I do, but um, it's looking at the last 20 years of the growth of the phraseologies of the creative city, the creative class, that terrifyingly creepy word called the creative, and the other friendly word of it that is also creepy, the in innovation. Um, I don't know if you guys use those words here. They just, they just sound like a gross TED Talk thing. Um, but you know, the world that where capitalism is entirely embraced the language of creativity. And now we have a world where you know, everyone is encouraging everyone to be creative uh, at all times. The arts profoundly has left the arts and has become a kind of logic of urbanism itself. So with that in mind, I will also turn to the public art projects, but I'm looking for a certain kind of, I guess one of the things I want to think about as I talk about my public art projects is, or not mine, but you know, to be fair, public art is a team sport. You know, it takes a lot of people. It's a village kind of style. But um, to think about the complexities of the forces that are using culture to get things done for a variety of reasons. And understanding that operating with that, within that landscape um, requires some savviness. And also, I think, some, some, some self-assessment about impact. And quite honestly, a kind of getting real about some radical politics. Because as much as like this might seem crazy, right, when we talk about gentrification or we talk about the ways in which urban development is predominantly funded by developers, we are talking about occupation. And we're also talking about techniques of community development that do not only reflect the methodologies that are deployed by the US military, but I would say a similar kind of ethos at times as well. And so that produces some real problems as you look in the mirror. For me, not you maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you look in the mirror. Um, so we'll go to some projects too, because I think it's also good to um, ground things in practice. So you go view slideshow. So I work at a place called Creative Time. Like I said, I am 45 years old, and so is Creative Time. It was uh, founded in 1972. Oh, what happened? It just disappeared. It just disappeared. 
Oh my gosh. No, no, hold on. You, he's coming. It's okay, I'll just talk to you for a bit. Just come over here. Um, so in 1972, Creative Time, which was started by basically artists who were interested in doing projects in the city, you can imagine the urban environment of New York 72 is so different than New York City, gentrified, nightmarishly overpriced uh, urban development city that it is today. Thank you, brah. Um, so 1972, artists were interested in using abandoned derelict spaces to do projects. So there was projects like Art on the Beach. There was projects where they did a drive-in theater, which is in, totally impossible to imagine now, where you would just drive your car up and they would project films on the sides of buildings. And it was a way to kind of invigorate the landscape. And for, through most of the 70s and into the 80s, that was the kind of language of the arts in the city, that it was a kind of space to, op to produce ideas and operate kind of culture culturally, but also in a kind of ragtag, not well-funded, guerrilla aspect. And for most of the, early, the first 50% of Creative Time's life, it was very uh, shoestring, but it was a shoestring budget, and it was much more like artist-driven in so much as it was very performative, and not in your classic public art sense of like big sculptures. It was much more like guerrilla activity. And so I say that because that particular period is so different than the world we live in now. Not only is New York different, but also the, the, the kind of urban landscape that one operates within is also different, and our budgets are different. I've watched, so I've been here since 2007, and the relationship, which we'll get into too, with uh, art in public with developers, for example. There's no, you know, there's not like just a, an abandoned building down in uh, Brooklyn. We're just going to go and do a guerrilla project in. That's just not the case. So it is a whole totally different environment. Let me get into a project. When I first got to Creative Time, the second project I worked on was a project um, called Waiting for Godot in New Orleans by the artist Paul Chan. And this is two years after Hurricane Katrina. And the idea, which was, you know, it's funny because it's not an original idea at all, was totally um, overtly borrowed from Susan Sontag, who'd, host, who'd done Waiting for Godot uh, in Sarajevo during the Balkan Wars. And Paul was interested in doing Waiting for Godot um, in the landscape of New Orleans because he said that the landscape reminded him so much of every production of Samuel Beckett's play that he'd ever seen. But simultaneously, what became interesting about this project and which will feed into the kind of conversation around a community engagement was Paul eloquently stated that he wanted to do a play with a front end and a back end. The front end being the production of a play and the back end being the production of a public. And when I think about what that means, which is just to say, he also said, which I think was great, he said, we're going to organize this project Hezbollah style. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he was like, well, we're just going to go door to door and ask people what they need. And that's how we're going to organize this project. And so he was talking about a kind of Saul Linsky leftist community organizing model up that is applied to a very traditional kind of theatrical production. That model of working, and we could get into that because it's interesting, has really informed um, a lot of the work I've done since because the production of the play to me is not just a production, like it's, you could say it's just a production of a theater. And we worked actually with the Harlem Theater Company to produce it. And we also benefited greatly because the star of our play was a gentleman named Wendell Pierce, who was also the star of the show Treme, and he featured prominently in the show The Wire. I don't know if you guys seen it. Of course you have, because that's what we do. Um, but Wendell Pierce also kind of brought that to play. But the production of a play, what was fascinating, is and to me that's also in a, some ways a symbol of the production of artwork, which is there is an artwork or a sign, but then the back end is the social relations that are put into play to support the symbol. And the symbol without the social forces at play I think is something I'm not as much interested in anymore. I'm interested in how putting a sign into the urban sphere sets, in, sets into action an opportunity to rethink social relations. We did simple things. We hosted community dinners. We did potlucks. We worked with local uh, community organizations. And the thematic of waiting became a profound symbol for many different things that people were working through in New Orleans, from waiting for their 
um, FEMA trailer to arrive, waiting for their asthma test because the FEMA trailers had so much asthma problems, waiting for their insurance checks, waiting for people to return, waiting for the city to actually address their concerns, waiting for the federal government to provide any kind of aid. So waiting became an important metaphor to deal with this tragic, comic, terrible situation, which, just to say, is still entirely unresolved. Um, another, and <laughs> um, the other thing I'd say too, and it's important to bear in mind, is that was a project around race, obviously, um, and the, the Hurricane Katrina is entirely a story about race in America. Um, but when we started working on it, it was interesting because people said to us in the white community of New Orleans, oh, you're gonna do a play in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans? No white people will see your play. And then when we talked to organizers of color in the neighborhood and they said, oh, you're doing a theater play? No people of color are coming to your play. So it was like, basically the word we got from everybody was no one's coming. <laughs> and we, so of course we took that into our hearts. We said, well, then we definitely should do it. Um, but we did, and what was amazing was we had a very heterogeneous audience, and it broke down a lot of space around race and class that we thought, that really struck with me because, as we all know, finding spaces that are truly um, mixed race, mixed class, are rare in our very racialized society, and finding space to produce that's important and, and, and meaningful and also something one should always take note of, particularly in the really racist, weird art world. Um, I mean, and it is racist, right? Most art stuff you go to is just like, what, what the hell? Um, I did a project with the artist Jeremy Deller where we took a car. This is his idea, by the way. I'm just a, I'm just a supporting guy. Um, I took a car from Baghdad, Iraq, that was had been blown up in a marketplace bombing, and we traveled it through the United States with a U.S. soldier and a Iraqi soldier. Um, who who just come from the war and were able to talk to people about their experiences, and I'm going to show a clip <clears throat> of one of the people talking. <laughs> I'm really embarrassed by that picture too. Just to say, sorry. Um, hold on. Oh, this will be good. I was a civilian contractor with Kellogg, Brown, and Root, uh, which is a subsidiary of Halliburton. And I was uh, in the morale, welfare, and recreation programming department. And there were kind of the regular things of uh, planning basketball tournaments and arm wrestling tournaments and um, events like that. And a lot of what I ended up doing was really off the radar, informal kinds of things. I think one of the most exciting and unusual activities that we started to run was a, um, a regular um, Pictionary and manicure night and this is for US military personnel men and uh, they got really excited about Mary Kay manicures and would come on an nightly basis and stand in line to have their <laughs> their hands soft and softened so they're really unusual things like that does that mean they were very bored they were incredibly bored. They were bored out of their minds. They uh, were the best shape in the best shape of their lives because they worked out all the time um, and really sat around waiting to be given things to do. Um, and also, I think the most shocking thing for me was experiencing the futility of a lot of the missions that they were sent out to do, patrolling just to give them something to do, which was insane. Um, but just to say, so this project was really <laughs> if you looked at it, you would think it was the most boring project ever because it was a way to get people talking about the war. And so you would just have two guys sitting around this blown up car. But what was fascinating to me was it was a way to, in some ways, produce a social space that wasn't mediated by Fox News or CNN, a way to touch upon the conversation of the war that was open to just discussion from people that had been there and get their firsthand knowledge from it. And while we worked on it, what was fascinating to me is we were so concerned about um, 
getting attacked by right wing zealots or you know or patriots who felt like this was very anti war but in fact where our our concerns were totally opposite of what occurred because the people involved in the war were eager to discuss. In fact, we found so many young, like 20-year-old 20, 20 kids and like 21-year-old kids who'd already done a few tours that wanted to talk about it and their families. The people touched by the war were the most eager to talk in public about it. Um, the pushback we got was from the left wing, in fact, uh, who uh, a lot of the activists said, this is ridiculous. You, you know, the, the war is going on. Why would you put so much money towards something so ambiguous? You should put something towards something directly against the war, you know. And one guy said to us, which I thought was fun because he, he had a Hurricane Katrina moment. He said, it's as though... You went to Hurricane, like Hurricane Katrina happens, and there's there's bodies in the streets, and you want to do a project about the merits of Cajun food. Like, that's not the time or place for that. But I thought that was interesting to me, because, of course, in some ways it was um, a public art project that people felt like, so we have our activists who felt like it was too ambiguous, right? And then we got a critique in the New York Times that con were, that was convinced that it was good therapy for America, but it certainly wasn't an art project. So, you know, just to say, public art is one of these things where just you have to have very thick skin because you know it's successful when everyone talks about why it's bad. <laughs> Which is like my whole, <laughs> I'm surprised I'm here with you guys at Harvard because like, if you look at all my reviews, it's all negative. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, that's the public sphere. It's like, you know, democracy is a world of people hating on each other. That, um, all right. So then I did, I, I'm just going to go through a few more projects. I have so many fun little things. Uh, we did a project in 2010 with the artist Paul Ramirez Jonas, who I think has done a bunch of projects out here, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's great. I love Paul. So uh, we did a project called Key to the City. Um, I think there's actually, he's got a little piece of land out here that people in Cambridge have got a key to. That's right. So he, we did this project, Key to the City, which became the official key to the city of New York for one month. And Mayor Bloomberg actually announced it, which was pretty fun. And it, it, we released 36,000 of these keys. You would go to Times Square, and you had to actually bestow it upon someone. So it was very ceremonial. And the key to the city that you would physically get in your hand after doing this ceremony would open up physical spaces throughout the boroughs, from the super high-end, important social capital spaces to super private, quiet spaces to su certain peculiar spaces. So for example, there was a locker at Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn that you could open. You have to go in this boxing place, go into the back area, open up this locker, and there was all this boxing memorabilia there. You could go to a tort tort tortilla, it's called Tortilla Nixtamal in Queens, and you'd go to the back door, open it with your key, you could go down these stairs and make tortillas with the people working there, it was awesome. You could go to Bryant Park, put your key in a light and turn it on and off. <laughs> Pretty fun. You could go to the Brooklyn Museum, and it was like Scooby-Doo. You could just, like, between these two paintings was a little door, and you opened it with your key, and there was a private exhibition for you. Isn't that awesome? But there was all, And there was also a private exhibition in the mayor's house at Gracie Mansion, because he never lived there. Um, he's like, sure, you can use the house. Um, we also, I mean, this project was a total pain. All of them were a total pain, but that, this one was a project was a pain because we worked um, with Port Authority to get access to the George Washington Bridge to, so that you could open up the pedestrian walkway to walk across the bridge. And first of all, I don't think hardly anybody did it, which is a shame since it required 4,000 meetings to get done. <laughs> But it's important to be able to open up the bridge to the city, literally. So, but what's fun about that too is, it, you know, it's a to me the project's kind of a metaphor for public art, which was it was offering access to things you kind of already had access to, and the key becomes this space of opening up between the private and the public. And then I also, you know, for me, it's like Paul Mears Jones joked. He thought he said, you know, this is going to become my cows on parade project. Like that's all people are ever going to want me to do anymore. Um, but it's a great project. I kind of wish every city would just do it. So you feel free to steal it. It's okay. I mean, but tell him. Um, 
We also worked with the artist Tanya Bruguera on a project called Immigrant Movement International, where she decided to work on it. Well, the backstory is very funny because she said to me, I want to start a political party for immigrants in America. And I said, let's do that. And then I realized what defines a 501c3 is that you can't start a political party. Um, so I was like, wait, that's the one project I can't work on at creative time. Um, but we did start this project called Immigrant Movement International, which became a space to think through the political imaginary of what a global immigrant um, community would look like and how it could function. And so she produced, and this is a partnership with the Queens Museum. And so she produced this space in Corona, Queens, which became a community service center and a space of thinking about the global possibilities of a uh, citizenry that's inter truly international without national borders. And just to give you a sense of the community organizing that went into this, because this is one of those things that you can say is great, but until you understand the work that goes into it, the back end, as Paul Chan would say, you don't know. And the back end of this, well, just let me give you a sense of it. These are all the classes they offered. <laughs> um, and it's been going, it continues to go. So it's been going for uh, six years now. That's a lot of work. I worked with the artist Suzanne Lacey, where we worked with community organizers and activists, 400 of them, women, to do a project between cross-race, cross-gen, cross, sorry, cross-race, cross-age, and cross-disciplinary on the conversation around um, contemporary feminism, basically, and, and gender rights, and the way it was orchestrated after talking to a gazillion people to get involved in this was to actually have these kind of conversations that were on stoops across one street in Brooklyn where you could listen in on the various um, discussions that people are having. I'll give you a little video of that too. I want to check my email while I'm here. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, wait, I'm running out of time. I'll do. I'll do. I'll do something else for you. So we'll do this Kara Walker project too, because it is kind of like my platinum album. So we worked with the artist Kara Walker and the Domino Sugar Factory to do this giant project. So this was a large-scale sculpture in the old Domino Sugar, sugar Refinery plant in Williamsburg. Sort of marzipan, a sugar sculpture made out of sugar paste, a kind of fondant that typically in these large banquets that would have been thrown in the medieval era at the court of King Henry, they would have had main course and then a sugar subtlety, and then people would eat it. So it had all this kind of power of ingesting that this desirable, precious substance, but also you're sort of ingesting the power of the king. Anyway, when I heard the term subtlety, I was, I was a goner. I was like, oh, I have to make a sugar sculpture. I was like, oh, of course. I'm really proud that Creative Time is undertaking this extremely ambitious project. It's not just ambitious in scale. It's ambitious in terms of its content. Kara Walker is encouraging us to look at things that are so visible in our society that we wish were invisible. Our history to slavery and our contemporary relationship to slavery immigration, migration, mythologizing of black women's bodies. And it's our belief at Creative Time that public art creates a space to engage in those difficult conversations. The Domino Sugar Factory is doing a large part of the work. And I think accepting that the building itself is creating the context and it is like the sculpture, it is kind of the subtlety. To make a piece that would sort of complement it, echo it, 
and hopefully it contain his assorted meanings about imperialism, about slavery, about a slave trade that traded sugar for bodies and bodies for sugar. So these are these cast figurines that were made entirely of sugar here. Um, and then we made this enormous sphinx-like sculpture um, that was covered in a sugar slurry, is the word. But that's not sugar, just a, it was styrofoam inside. When we started to get an understanding of what Kara's vision was, a lot of people thought that it was impossible, and so it's been incredibly exciting to assemble this team of problem solvers that have turned this into a reality. Well, the space in and of itself, it's, that's all. Right. Anyways, so that was really popular. I got a call on my phone from Usher, Usher's people, asking to go backstage. And I was like, well, it's public art. It's free and open to the public. Come on down. Don't have a backstage here, Usher. Um, but it's like, but just to say it was a really impressive project. People came and, um, and also Kara Walker, of course, she's incredibly brilliant, but she also understood the nature of public art and really went for the kind of monumental, literally monumentality of it. And it also, fascinatingly enough, just to say something very, over the years it's just shifted dramatically in my experience with public art, is the role of social media in terms of the, its profound ability to produce discussions with art and public because... You know, I mean, every one of our projects now, even if no single reporter reported on it, would just become this, it just takes off in social media spheres very fast. And people, it's, I hate the word grammable, but it is all very grammable, but also discursive and gets people talking and debating and trolling each other. Um, but it is, it's, it's interesting because it does become a kind of fulcrum or a kind of catalyst for a certain kind of social civic sense, which I find extremely exciting and interesting and, um, <laughs> and new, relatively so, for the work we've been doing. I want to show one final project, and then I will um, be done-ish. Um, and it is, well, I'll go here. So, it's funny because, it's not funny, but, so, at the same, the same year that we did the Kara Walker project, I also worked on this project called Funk God, Jazz, and Medicine, Black Radical Brooklyn. And I think Kara Walker's project attracted 145,000 people. And this project, um, which I'm sure many of you have not heard of, attracted 5,200. <laughs> so not success in terms of audience, but I love this project, so I have to tell you about it. It's... Um, it was a partnership with this place called Weeksville Heritage Center, and it is a historic African-American um, community that was um, started by a guy named John Weeks, who understood that if you owned property, you could vote, you were allowed to vote, and so they st he started encouraging free blacks to buy property in this area called Weeksville um, in order to produce a self-determined black community in the um, mid early 19th century. So. In 1968, this, this place had been lost to time, and a radical anthropology group from CUNY um, actually had heard about the um, history of Weeksville and wanted to find out if the actual homes or any legacy of it was still around. And so they actually flew a prop plane over Brooklyn uh, and found three of the original homes because they actually went against the grid. And so they started a community organizing effort and made it a historical home. Uh, and community center called Weeksville, and we partnered with them to um, do a project around radical black self-determination. And the site itself is very invested in that narrative, but I was also on a much, on a different level, and something I'm very invested in in terms of this conversation and just future work, is I kept thinking about the, um, how the money is spent as being one of the most important parts of a project and where the resources go, not just what it's about, but where the resources actually end up and who they support. And so thinking about the money of a project as going towards sites of black self-determination in Brooklyn and to encourage those struggles and to also support the people doing that work rather than a project that just abstractly talks about that. But I guess to be simple, a project that puts its money where its mouth is. And so this project, which only had 5,200 people come, <laughs> 
um, involved partnering artists with community organizations that embodied that ethos to produce projects and together. And then the idea would be that you would go to see the show and go to each different site of black self-determination to see an artwork. So we had the artist Zenobia Bailey work with the Boys and Girls High School and they, um, she worked with a class there and then they produced a space in one of the historic homes. We worked with the filmmaker Bradford Young who he wasn't as famous then, but now he, he just was up for an Oscar for cinematography for that film Arrival. And he, um, he did this cinematic piece with the Bethel Tabernacle AME Church, which was the first black owned church in um, New York. And so he worked with their congregation to produce a film and that was situated in one of their old buildings. We worked with the group Otabanga Jones and Associates with the local jazz consortium to produce an outdoor a uh, community radio center that was in the back of a chopped in half pink Cadillac with big speakers in the back that became a commu radical community radio station that was there for six weeks. And then we worked with the artist Simone Lee to do a project called the um, Free People's Medical Clinic, inspired in two parts, one by the history of radical black nurses, and secondly with the Black Panthers project around doing um, community health services in Oakland and across the country. So this actually was a partnership with a, um, a local um, community health organization that had been started by Josephine um, English, who had been the first Obgyn, female Obgyn in uh, black female Obgyn in New York who also delivered all six of Malcolm X's children and was really interested, invested in the conversation around community health. And so this space became a way to like not only think about preventative medicine, but also holistic medicine. She offered workshops of yoga. And it was weird too because she had this kind of like sci-fi soundtrack in there and these kind of futuristic beautiful nurses that were just like come in oh, and there's like herbs everywhere and it became this kind of community center that was dreamy and possible and really really popular and grew and grew and so but just to say I say that as a kind of interesting way maybe as a way we can kind of think through when we <clears throat> talk about um, my first video which was uh, I guess I'd say community relations is a certain kind of way of ameliorating tensions. Like I think there's an interesting, there's an important way of working where the resources go towards the struggle and the people invested in it. And I do think it is a very much about race in the city. And it is about not just talking about things, but where the kind of capital and capacity go. I also say that because as you know, um, the conversation on gentrification and urbanism is so important, and it haunts everything we do at this point at Creative Time. And I think it haunts most of the work anybody is probably doing in many cities. You know, we were joking earlier that, you know, I, you know, I, I hope when I die, I get the kind of, someone's gonna let me know if I was for the force of good or bad. <laughs> Because it's, sometimes it's really hard to know what force you're fighting for, you know, when you've got developers paying entirely for your projects in cities, and um, the forces of capital are really not just ambivalent but very aggressively exploitative towards the most um, oppressed communities in our um, country. So. You know, I'm invested in a kind of social justice politics and a radical politics, but it's not enough just to say that you actually have to be kind of Machiavellian and, and, and radical in terms of the ways in which you kind of organize or to get, you know, as you organize Hezbollah style, if you will. So um, that's what I have to say. <laughs> it's not your typical approach to public art, I know. Um, but at the same time, too, I'll say one other thing about the magic of public art for those that you're not really interested in public art as something you study a lot. I do believe profoundly in the power of art. And I say that as much as I'm very Marxist and political, I believe deeply in the power of dreams and weirdness and irrationality and, and unfunctionality as a space to open up the deeply pedantic utilitarian space of the city. To find spaces where it's not overtly a commercial or an advertisement, to produce space where it's about debate, it's about wonder, and it's about the kind of complexities of the civic that ignite us together. Finding room, and I think it requires a bit of a wrestling match with the forces that are very powerful in the city to overdetermine everything, is where the, the kind of um, battleground lies. And 
and I think it's the one of the great battles. And you know, as much as like you know, we live in one of the most terrifying political climates in my lifetime with Trump as the president. But as much as it's easy, you know, I think it's important to push back on that. I think it's also simultaneously important to fight for the power to be non obvious and ambiguous and dream at the same time as you fight back. So thanks so much. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. So uh, we're going to ask Assemble to, to, to join us in, in um, conversation with NATO, as well as Sandra Branch, who uh, presented with with us in um, this this morning, um, and um, maybe I'll, just because we hadn't um, planned enough mics, I'll I'll stand up here for a second. Um, Oh, thanks. Oh, that's kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> I'll be your, your interrogator here. Um, so um, I guess because because I I um, I'm normally thinking about your work as being um, super political and and socially activist, and I and I, I even remember you from before you were a curator as an activist in Chicago, doing this public space projects um i th i i wanted when to i got arrested by mtv did, did we tried know? to liberate the actors of the real world from their unreality <laughs> i'm not joking <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny uh, they didn't find it funny mtv has no sense of humor uh when it comes to disrupting their film shoot but it was great fun so so i yeah i thought it would be worth um Talking a little bit further about the 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 curatorial process and you in in the sort of intentionality behind it, that, because um, I mean, of course, public art is always caught up in all these um, implications of um, the 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 potential knock-on effects for development and inflation of value and things like that, but. Uh, yet the ephemerality of a, a lot of the things that you're that you're doing in New York, um, I think, helps prevent them from seeming to have a a, a a a direct impact. It's not like the Domino Sugar development wasn't going to happen if you didn't do a sculpture in that building. It was already uh, in the in the bank, essentially. Um, but um, so. Can you talk about the the extent to which you're able to um, try to produce social and political effects through through these projects and and, um, and what kind of aspirations you you have as a as a curator to have consequences or is that too too far? It's fine. You know when I so just to say I grew up as an anarcho. I thought I was going to be a professional anarchist when I grew up, and then I realized that's totally such a Berkeley college. I went to Berkeley, by the way, if you can't tell. So I was like, but just to say, I got a job at Mass Mocha after grad school and as an assistant curator, and I was convinced my entire life that the art world was evil and that like, if you had any radical ideas, they would just kick you out. And so I was, so, and I was actually on trial for this real world thing when I got my job. I only say that because I found a real connection with the director there, Joe Thompson, no relation. Um, because while he's clearly not a Marxist, he's raising the dough with the Williams College people. Um, we did agree on something that I thought was very, that helped me a lot in this, which was he was very populist. And you know, it's a, it's, it's a museum in a town of 12,000. And he was invested in art that spoke to all people. And so was I. And while we didn't have the same political analysis, our enthusiasm for a certain kind of public discourse made me understand that the contradictions of capital could still find some kind of space. Like my analysis and his analysis could find some kind of commingling 
in our belief in the power of the civic and then thinking of the museum as a civic space. And that's the same kind of way that I've been able to wrestle that with creative time is because certainly our board is not Marxist. <laughs> uh, but that said, uh, being relevant is helpful for art. And just to say, on a kind of Machiavellian level, relevant art actually does well for artists and art organizations. Um, go figure. So it's just to say it's kind of a, it's a strategic kind of maneuvering through that. And I try, for me, it's like, you know, the production of meaning is political itself. You know, meaningful things is political. It's a different kind of politics. But finding things that touches people's hearts um, and gets them involved and also thinks through race and class you know, all these things we're already wrestling with and art that kind of unpacks that and opens that up for people is exciting. So it's, 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 but it is a bit of a, um, I mean, we could we'll get in that, you know, it's like, it, it is a balancing act with, with kind of trying to get, to try to have a kind of politics of liberation in a space that's deeply exploitative and proprietary. Um, I've got, got a question about coming back to that idea of capital which is, um, is I guess a term that we've come across a few times is, is the idea of like capture and steer. I was wondering, you talk about you know, where the money goes, but I wonder if you could talk a bit more about where the money comes from, in that there's a, like, a complicit relationship between who funds these things and there's an ex expectation, and something that we've discovered a lot in, in the UK, that there's increasingly there's like, you know, outputs required from, from funding that's being delivered, and how, like, how do you negotiate those two, I guess, it's often, the, often quite oppositional, and that what you've in what you're saying is trying to provide a kind of slack space for alternatives, where actually the, the funders may, may frequently be looking for the, the, the total opposite. Well, you know, it's weird too because, I mean, we could do an ethnography of funding if you want, like, um, because it's, it's peculiar, you know, and obviously the United States has a very specific and unique nonprofit system that I know y'all over across the pond are certainly eager to mimic, but certainly the culture of philanthropy and the systems for that are not the same. And in the United States, you know, I mean, Creative Time has this interesting space because it's not just some public arts organization. It's a public art organization in New York City, which is just to say there is a culture of philanthropy in New York. And most of our board members already are on museum boards, which I think offers us a certain kind of freedom because we're the kind of side project that can be fun. <laughs> Where I think they might want their artists represented more in like the Whitney or MoMA, you know, like, okay, now, now show these things. But like, but we don't get that same kind of pressure in that space, you know, frankly. And foundations, honestly, it's bizarre. But like I found the social justice stuff gets, is much more fun. To, like the more overtly like community organizing, the more foundations are like, yeah, 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 that's what I want, you know. So, it, it, I mean, just to say it's like that stuff, I'm almost like in a kind of crass way, you can be like playing that up more. If you're just going for the dollars, the stuff that's very hard to fund is the art that art world people don't collect and doesn't directly, obviously lead to some social justice thing. That's like the the black hole of no funding, <laughs> where you'll you know. So just to say the kind of and it's bizarre because people would say, oh wait, this socially progressive stuff. How in the world do you get funding for that? But there's funding for that, particularly in Trump's America. You know, that's all people want is like anything to kind of get those kind of values on the table, which leads in its own kind of industrial complex way to like everybody offering community organizing in, in, a, in a kind of crass approach. You could say people do it just so they can get the funding dollars, right? Or they're like, yeah, yeah, we have a community thing and they top, they all write it up in the grant proposal and they say they're doing those things because they know what the funders want. And you know, and then they kind of they use that as a way to support something else. I'm not being mean about it, but I guess we all understand that that happened. I'm curious because I think it's something that we sort of grapple with within our own projects. Um, is how you deal with uh, some of your projects, which you sort of presented, which obviously have a sort of, um, I suppose, like an initial impulse, like the I, I forget what, what the immigrant. Um, yeah, yeah, the immigrant movement international. For, sure. exa for example, or, or the the medicine project in Brooklyn, and um, and are the are they normally set up as sort of uh, to have like a limited temporal lifespan, and or and do they ever sort of grow to become more permanent, or is that something at 
creative time that you sort of help negotiate or try? I'm curious. It's a good question, and certainly each project has its own kind of situation. You know, so for particularly with that one, you know, that was a project. Tanya Bruguera, because she's Cuban, she said, "I'm Cuban, so I think in five-year plans," which I always thought was funny. Um, but uh, so she was like, "I want to do this for five years." That was what she said from the outset, and and that's what she did. But at the same time, that was the one project that looked. It was that one was a very odd project because it was the one that looked the most like a non-profit NGO. Like, you know, it's it's almost like the re ready-made in reverse, where she was mimicking social justice organizations to the point that it became a kind of experimental social justice organization. And so the conversation was like, do we keep that going? And it is, it's left Tanya, and it is still going, mm. and and it is its own operating thing now. So that is something that was important to the work itself. But just to be fair to, not to us, but also put our cards on the table, we don't have the bandwidth or capacity to do long-term things. And so if something were to do a project that had a long-term aspiration, we would need to negotiate a certain partnership that took it over. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that is a certain skill set. And it's tough, too, because I feel like one of the mistakes with social justice projects is where you promise things you can't deliver on. You know, and, you, and so you make it seem like you're going to be around forever, but you really have no intention. I feel like it's, you know, like when we were in New Orleans, everyone's like, well, why didn't you stick around New Orleans and stuff? When we're like, we told everybody understood it's a play and you're going to leave town. It's not like they're like, oh, my gosh, I need you to stick around forever. But, you know, being very clear on your limits is, imp I mean, I'm sure you, with your guys' work, you come across that, right? Yeah, no, and, and you know we've been sort of having conversations. Uh, I think sort of today really, um, and yeah, and it's, and it's a tricky thing to negotiate. And I think that one of the things that we discussed um, earlier um, was the sort of the way that you can unintentionally also become very emotionally involved in projects. And it's certainly something that we have experienced where we have intended things to be more temporary. Um, um, so for example, we, we talked about a project to set up an adventure playground in Glasgow. And the original impulse was for a 12 month play project. Um, and, and sort of once we were on the ground, uh, that sort of aspiration changed quite quickly. And we found ourselves kind of willing and wanting and working with uh, the sort of the, the the people running the organisation there to try and make the situation more permanent because it just felt like an important thing to do and so therefore I guess that's where the question was sort of born from because you know I understand that sort of um, the the need to sort of negotiate uh, these sorts of these these relationships and that sometimes you do need to be able to walk away as you say and a play is a play and the curtain comes down and 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 other times you say oh, well actually what could happen if this could keep going i mean you know that's the um i feel like that's the tricky thing of you know it's like not how one operates within a larger ecosystem is interesting to bear in mind because like while creative time does these projects right there's a certain thing that haunts me is more you know like you start seeing these kind of Utopian imaginary spaces in urban environments kind of popping up and disappearing, right? And like yesterday, I was talking to someone, they were like, well, what are we supposed to do about gentrification? And then my buddy Trevor just said, well, you just get rent control, right? But just to say, like, what I mean by that is like, you don't set up an experimental community <laughs> in a neighborhood to demonstrate the political horizon. You know, like, there is a certain space in which policy is important to address and, and like, and it feels really annoying after a while where we demonstrate – it's almost like I understand why we do temporary stuff. Hey, we can't. But also on a media scape-wise, the attention span bear dwindles out, and we got to do something new. And so we are to some degree complicit in a certain kind of spectacle media logic where like if you did a project for 12 years, for example, you'd get an article in the beginning – and then you'd be done media-wise, and people would pat you on the back. Good work for 12 years, but your funding would disappear. You know what I mean? So I feel like the temporality around this stuff also has its own problematics. I, I was just going uh, go, go ahead. Um, I also experienced that. I work in a depressed area in Flint, Michigan. And um, when we put on projects, they, they're like, oh, wow, I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you're here. But the one thing that you don't want to do is promise something you cannot deliver. Because then that sticks with you. That follows you. That's the monkey on your back. Oh, I know her. She promises the world and delivers stones, you know, or she's Santa Claus with a bag of coal. Well, you don't do that. And that's why I always tell them, this 
is up to you how far this goes. If you want this to continue, you must find a way to continue it. Sustainability is in your hands. And that's why I always do that. But I want to know, because there's not a lot of funding in a desert like Flint where everybody is in need, everybody's got their hand out. How do you bring that funding, even though there's a need for it, it's not available? And uh, with uh, a depressed community like that, everybody's got their hand out. And the only funding is going for water, water. It's like, forget the arts now, it's water. And when we started doing um, political murals about the water situation, sure, it got a lot of attention. Everybody was like, wow, yeah, oh, that's powerful. But then the people that will fund you don't want you to display it in their area. It's like, oh yeah, that's great. You're doing great work, but we don't want you to bring it over here. <laughs> so what do you do with stuff like that? I mean, I don't know the answer to that. It's a bit, but it is, it is systemic, obviously, right? I mean, don't you think? I mean, obviously, because like, I mean, that's the funny thing. It's like if I was a doctor of cities and I took my stethoscope and I went over New York, I wouldn't be like, this city suffers from a lack of cultural programming. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yet it just keeps coming, rah, cranking it out. You know, everyone's like, oh, we got to do an art project here. But like Flint, you know, you could use some cultural programming over there, right? But where's the bang for the buck? Like what rich person wants to head out to Flint to do that, right? Yeah. So there's a, there's a structural racist political component to this funding models. That said, I would say my gut tells me is Kresge is the one to go to because they do support cultural programming in the Midwest, I mean, right? Is that right? It's Kresge has a Detroit program, and it's very it's very sp specific to the boundaries of Detroit. And then, otherwise, you fall into the larger Kresge Foundation pot that's nationwide. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, they are in in Michigan, so it's that's helpful. But what, I was I'd, I'd say go to Betsy DeVos. She's very philanthropic. <laughs> Or, or Eric <laughs> Prince, you know. Sorry. So I would I would ask one more question along these lines, and then open it up for for um, others to ask questions. Um, the so Creative Time has this this history actually that going back, as you said, to the 1970s, 1973, and it was you know f f founded essentially to activate vacant office towers that were built in the middle of an oil embargo. And um, so there was this kind of great opportunity of, of vacancy that was then kind of taken up by some, some, some of the cultural organizations that David Rockefeller was, was, was fu funding. And it really, it, it, even though the, the work was very uh, coming, coming out of a, a, a uh, space of the, the Soho artist community and um, a kind of a radical context. Um, it did. It it did. It was intended to serve as a as a tool of de development. Something that that I think in our context in Flint and in some of your projects in in England is is a position that we we're sort of being asked to play. And I know that you, you know, in the context of creative placemaking, it's become a, fo a formulaic way that uh, public art is meant, is being pushed and being funded to to, to serve. So I don't know um, what, what's your what's your reaction to that to the sort of broader narratives of public art that are prevalent right now. Well, it's just to say this term placemaking, which is. It's it's I don't know how ubiquitous is is it? Do you guys get that word? You do, yeah, okay. But you know I don't want to be snotty about it because there is some good parts to it. So I am being snotty about it. Um, it's my backhanded compliment. There's some good things to it, but you know certainly um, what's interesting is it is about art in the public sphere, and I've watched that learning curve because you know, like at first it used to be much more this kind of creepy Richard Florida creative economies logic. But then I've seen it shift as the conversation around social justice and race have been pushing themselves into that. And the funders, I think, are have been much more 
cognizant and, tr and, and working with that to think through, like, what are the implications? And I also think with the growth of gentrification as a narrative within urban spaces, that it's hard, you'd have to really have your head in the sand to not talk about that if you're going to talk about development models in cities. So I think they understand that, the, that, and it is useful because it's, for me, it's much better than the conversation around art and museums. You know, at least we're talking about race and class and political economy and urban space. So in that way, it's been a very productive space to interrogate. At the same time, there is a lot of very misaligned and confusing politics that are going into a lot of money, you know, that is being thrown around. But I do, you know, just to say, I mean, with, the, with the funding thing, two parts. One, I do think the placemaking ones is good. You got an art place grant, right? Yeah, and then, um, and the other one I'd say is, I think all of us don't need to defend the arts. We need to go on an arts offensive. Because <laughs> I think the NEA's budget should be $1 billion and not sit there going like, can I please have $30 million? Like, because then you can have a national program for cultural programming. Because what we're talking about with Flint is, it's just like, that's a federal problem. You know, that is something that can't be resolved by one foundation or an arts organization. That is, should be a sustained program of social infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I, sorry, I, I don't have a, I suppose I feel particularly sort of articulate response, but it's sort of making me think about uh, something that I've noticed a lot in the UK and I feel is probably um, sort of more extreme in the US, which is um, the way that I suppose uh, money for, for public art projects is increasingly uh, used by, you know, people um, like us as well, um, as a sort of, to do projects which in some way are, you know, a, a panacea for things that should be, if you like, centrally funded. Um, and I think that's because um, that's where the holes are and that's where, the, therefore, like, they become an interesting space within which to do projects. But actually, as you say, I, that's not, that's not, you know, ideally that money uh, shouldn't be coming from these sorts of small, uh, diffuse pots, but you know, would be coming from would be coming from central government. Well, you know, it's so funny because, like, yeah, exactly. Like, if you if you so let's say platform heads over to um, Stockholm, you know, and it's just a different. You know, it's like you go to Stockholm in the environment of doing like interventionist or urban development projects that we do in the U.S. Like, it's so radically different. You know, they're like, <laughs> oh right, well, I mean, you know, we don't really don't have as many things to complain about over there, but like. Whereas over here, everyone's like, look at me. I'm purifying water. I'm like doing basic needs of like a community that should be supported by the state. That is the kind of lament about social engaged art often is that like it's trying to like put the finger in the dam of like a total privatization of all infrastructure. And we are like part of that. But at the same time, it does more than that, I would say too. Yeah, I, I think it's something that I, as someone who, who like utilize those for the funding feel deeply conflicted by where it's like you are in some ways propping up an argument about um allowing privatization and, and philanthropy as a model for like, social justice which is i think in some ways politically is quite dangerous but equally it's better than doing nothing which is the other the alternative and so it's like a kind of in some ways i well, personally feel like it's quite horrible catch me too where it's like you are providing backup for an argument about um, enabling social justice to be only through philanthropic enterprises, but also without doing anything that's going to happen. You know, where do you kind of, where do you intervene and where do you just let it go? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really tough. I mean, it's also, I mean, because <laughs> you, you can start to feel like you're like the charter school. You know, like, you're like, but I'm a well-intentioned charter school, but I'm totally playing into this, like, defunding federal ed education policies, you know? So it's like, I, I feel that it sometimes, too, but at the same time, to be more fair, <laughs> like, it's funny, because you do go to, you know, like, to kind of pick on Scandinavia, because let's do that, you know? We don't have, they don't get a full pass. Like, at least with a not government-funded thing that we do, we could talk about flagrantly race, and racism, we don't have to worry about like staying on message with a giant PR machine. I mean, there is some freedom in the model that we have that I find very valuable. And you can kick, it's bizarre, because, but you can kick and push a lot more in, in this kind of model, I find, and that's useful in some ways to just throw some cards on the table. 
And I think that's true. And then, like, something we found, again, by, by acting as artists, by wearing the kind of artist hat, you can do work that, if you're an kind of architecture commission, that people assume has certain outputs you'd never be able to get away with because it wouldn't fit, wouldn't take the right boxes, it wouldn't take the right health and safety or output or other thing boxes. And so, like, there is a, a definite argument for kind of co-opting and utilising funds of the art because actually there's a, there's a kind of level of freedom there that you don't have the more kind of practical outputs or like traditional architectural outputs. I mean, it's it's the greatest passport of all time. I mean, it's like your biggest visa because like you're just like because you know when people get all utilitarian on you, they're like what is that for? Who does that affect? You know what? How many uh, tourist dollars does that attract? You're just like, I'm an artist. <laughs> I don't deal with your pedantic questions. And I, I, you know, sometimes I feel like, hell yeah, man. Sometimes it's good to push back like that, you know? Well, let's open up um, to, to questions if anybody, um, I think there's a, a, a mic, a couple of mics running around, a few, three. Hi, thanks for the inspirational talk. Um, I'm just wondering, I had this question for the speakers this morning as well, but do you think, in time, these projects and this idea of public art as community engagement um, can be so culturally influential that it will shape market demand and kind of allow the market to support um, the initiatives rather than being subversive to it? Or is it only art if it's subversive? I mean, it's already got market demand. There's an artist named Theaster Gates who is filthy rich, and he's doing community development projects that are very popular with Rahm Emanuel and the Chicago Bulls as big funders. So, you know, just to say, there's a market out there, but I wouldn't say it's big. It's almost like with the art world, you get like three stars and the rest of us go broke. So it, it, it is, but I, you know, because I, I do think there's a certain kind of market sensibility, but the arts are particularly fickle. You know, it is a, uh, it is a luxury good. And it is all about scarcity in the arts in particular. That particular world is very scarcity driven. And um, the sad thing about the art world is that the bigger the wealth gap, the better the art world does. So, you know, because of course there's just much more luxury money out there. I did want to address that. He's right. It's the 1% that you're going for. They're the ones that have that money to support and the money to pay for the projects. But we hope that, yes, it starts a bigger movement that makes it culturally acceptable. That's the um, orgasm we have in our brain about this art, but it doesn't really pan out that way. Usually it's a passion that the artist has that he's putting out there and he's saying, accept me. This is part of who I am, but yet it's still, in public art, a voice of the people. And so it's, this is what they're saying, but you can't hear them. So it's not always a matter of how much money, but how much action that it inspires. Because it's art if it evokes an emotion. It doesn't have to be good. The emotion is there. But also, too, I was thinking, because in, doesn't there, don't you guys have, um is it in Grand Rapids? That thing, Art... Art, uh, yeah, art Prize. Art Prize, right? Yeah, every Is year. that thing hugely popular? Yes, it's very popular. And they're usually using um, students that are unknown. So they do get a name. They get their, their stuff out there. And it's funded by the DeVos family. I know, right, right. Um, One percent. <laughs> was, uh, my joke used to be that... that the foundations that have to give away one one percent of 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 their capital every year, and they've essentially stolen our tax dollars by by creating private private foundations. And our job is to take it from them. So, um, I like that gorilla Hezbollah thing. I, I didn't even know I was doing it. <laughs> but um, any other questions? Don't be shy. I think it's very interesting that you said, I didn't even realize that I was doing it. I think for a lot of people who are activists and artists, that's one of the most difficult things. When you are someone who is working within communities, somebody who is doing, uh, creating projects that is socially and culturally relevant, it becomes very difficult to, if you're not in an institution, to understand what you're doing is relevant to the institution. So I guess my question is, how do you seek that validation 
and understand uh, while understanding that things like funding are important as we've seen while at the same time not compromising our mission and our message. Anybody else want? Okay. <laughs> well, I think that you you get your validation by when people say that's what I was saying or that's what I feel. You know, it's not so much what they being put in the museum or being put up on a building. It's when you reach the people and when you say, okay, I'm not the only one that feels this way. I'm getting it out and I'm representing you and you and you and you. And so Together, we are this. This is our voice. So you become a voice for the voiceless, and that is satisfaction, and that is knowing that your work is accepted. I mean, for, for me, uh, 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 the way I, I would respond is that, um, you know, you do all this terrible work of writing grants and, like, trying to wrangle money from people, and and then it's difficult, the community meetings are difficult, people yell at you, and some, sometimes the projects are hated, and you know, uh, and all of that, you get trolled all, all the time. Um, but the thing that's, that's kind of magical from my point of view as someone who's not an artist and not a designer is that you kind of create a process and you create a platform for people to, cre to, to create their own work, and then when it works well, you get to kind of walk into a project that you never imagined, but you created a space for it to to happen in. And that's kind of like a, a joyous thing to, to see other people create in, in, a, in, in a place that, that you've sort of like set up for. I'd also take to, you know, life is a story called You're Not Invited. So it's like, you know, I think like it's important to understand. I feel like, it's funny because the museums would make you think like that's the work that most people are doing, but in fact, the kind of a lot of this social engaged art stuff. There's so many people doing this in cities, you know, like so many, and it's it's more the rule than the exception, really. It's just that the spaces that highlight stuff don't reflect the actual composition of practice that's out there. So I do think finding space to produce community and solidarity that are not reliant on the institutions is absolutely emotionally critical too. Because, you know, like this guy Greg Shillette has a book called Dark Matter, but it's like talking about the idea that, you know, with dark matter, it's all that, it's the dark matter that holds the universe together. But in the arts, it's a lot of these practices that hold the arts together that isn't actually in the institutions. You know, and I see that everywhere I go. There's so many people doing social engaged art. I mean, it's funny, it's like such a lame term because I just feel like people both want to make a difference and also are just inherently good with cultural manipulation. So that just, that is a modality a lot of people are comfortable with. Oh yeah, I mean, I like totally agree with you and I think what's sort of so evident is that the lens that gets shone on sort of certain people or certain projects is is just that. It's, it's a lens and there's sort of a whole broader world out there um, where those things don't get seen. And what can be really useful about those, those lenses is that you, you begin to sort of look back at the world and see uh, those, um, those things that you perhaps hadn't uh, valued or hadn't considered or hadn't uh, sort of seen the sort of perhaps the cultural value in uh, beforehand. So it makes me think of someone like Jeremy Deller's work, who is a, I don't know if people here are that familiar with him, but he's an, a, a British artist who uh, works very much with kind of... Uh, everyday uh, everyday culture um, largely in the UK a sort of uh, you know sort of contemporary folk culture if you like um, and also makes me think a lot I know I was sort of at a conversation um, in the UK with the sort of arts minister at the time Ed Vasey and one and it was sort of a round table discussion about a new kind of arts paper and uh, someone sort of raised the point about going out into an area where there was no culture, where it was a shit area with no culture. And I just got so angry with this person. So it's like, how, how dare you say that? Um, how, how dare you sort of turn to someone else's sort of community? And, and it sort of reminded me, uh, to sort of end the point of, um, of, I was sort of doing a transcription of a series of uh, interviews with um, managers of Shore Start Centres in the UK, um, which are basically sort of early learning centres, and uh, one of the managers saying that she's got a, uh, she has these sort of very in-depth conversations with young mothers um, who are sort of like white working class mothers who say, you know, I wish, I wish I was 
I was you know, Indian because, because my Indian friends, they've got culture, they've got saris, they have delicious food, and we don't have that. You know, we, I have no culture, and, that, and the sort of the manager of the sort of early learning centre is like, I'm like, what are you talking about? Of course you do. You have a ritual of tea whenever someone enters your house. You have your birthday celebrations. Like, it's about, you know, you just need to learn that, learn the sort of the you know the visual material culture, the, the everyday culture that you inhabit, and you need to sort of learn to recognise that. And so, so going back to the start of the point, um, I think. The ability then of you know certain uh, sort of artists or practitioners to to focus those lenses and say oh yeah I, I never thought that that thing that I did was culture or was valuable I think that can be the sort of an amazing virtue and joy of, of some of this type of work yeah and to elaborate on that and Flint we we are that shit area that they say has no culture and when the uh, plants left and half of the uh, residents left and they left all these empty homes that are vacant and left to go through the process of gentrification so they can cleanse the city it's um she's right about the lens I have to go into each neighborhood, and my project varies with each neighborhood because I engage community. And I say, what is your culture? And they say, oh, well, we're black, or we're this, or we're that. No, no, that's who you are. Your culture is what you do. It's what you, the rituals that you have. It's how you live. It's how you enjoy. It's how you celebrate. And so I say, what is your flavor? Well, they've got a lot of flavor. Oh, we do this. We do that. That's their culture. And I focus a lens on that, and I bring it out through the murals that we do. And I say, okay, this is the flavor of this neighborhood. And that mural is the culture of that area. Even though we're one people, we're all American, there's little microcosms of culture. Maybe it's with these three houses. Maybe it's with this block. Maybe it's with this whole neighborhood. Maybe it's with this community. But you have to be that lens that says, I see you and I hear you. And that validates them. So when talking about developing culture or identifying those cultures that exist in, the, in those neighborhoods, how do you find uh, that balance between that culture attracting more uh, development and with that gentrification and then killing that culture that was vibrant and then just, you know, this full circle that goes over and over? Well, actually, we just remind them of where they came from and remind them of what their culture was. And then we also put up there what it was and what it has turned into, because it's always evolving. You know, when these people move in and these people move out, it changes. Like at one time, this was a predominantly white neighborhood that ended up going black and then it ended up going empty and then it ended up going abandoned but still there's still spots of that culture and you just have to say when they forget what it was remind them of who they are and it's still there so you deal with it as it comes it's fluid and you have to know that it's organic and it's going to change and you can't keep it that way it is what it is i, I, th I think that's kind of key is that there's a i guess there's a undertone of some of the sort of um, gentrification conversation that actually what you want to do is keep things in total stasis. And I think with some of the work, like things will change. I think for me, the bigger question is who benefits from those changes and how through the kind of the structure of the work and the kind of creation of organizations or the, the impact of work, you can, you can share benefits more widely rather than, rather than a kind of aim for a stasis, which is, is, is kind of self-defeating. Um, you know, and these, a lot of these areas have real like social problems that do need investment. And you know, with those investments, there is going to be a change in identification. Um, and like trying to stop it completely is a, is a kind of losing game. So it's like more like how do you reframe it? How do you share the benefits? How do you change? And I guess that's where that question also of, of capital and economy comes in, and how you stop. You know, that the culture is a way of also people seeing value and seeing agency in, in what they're doing, and also enables them to kind of take on ownership. And, and you know, it's a kind of pride thing that also means that then when changes do come, they're much people are much better able to to um, kind of take control of it rather than just be kind of victims of it. I think it's kind of almost just like changing the narrative about what the value relative values are can have a huge impact on that on that process. And you, also, oh, sorry. Uh, and you also have to explain to them what 
process is going on because when they're in it, they don't see that it's gentrification until you explain it to them. You say, this is the process that's going on. And you can't be outside here saying, we're getting mowed over. You have to actually go to the table. You have to have a seat at the table before they can give you a plate. So if you're not part of the process, if you don't get into the meetings with those people, go to your city meetings, tell them what to do, empower them to be at that table so that they don't get mowed over, they don't get lost, because it's investment in people and the big businesses that have the money or the schools or whoever is doing the process of gentrification, they don't want to be labeled as the villain. You put that snidely whiplash hat on them and all of a sudden they change. Oh no, no, we want you, we want you here. So you tell them how to get a seat at the table because change is never done from the outside, it's done from inside. <laughs> Sorry, it's a sort of uh, a slight aside, but partly because I feel like maybe there's a strand of the conversation which is about um, sort of, uh, if you like, going into a context and doing a project. And I think what, for, for me, it's also very personal. It's like, like I've benefited from uh, many public art projects, or I've benefited from... Um, access to the arts throughout my whole life and for me that's a, so much another dimension of how I, I see the world and an ability to feel a sort of uh, um, to feel like I can sort of understand and engage with like uh, the world of visual and material culture which is such an important element of this you know <laughs> world we're in that's full of images and that I think is really you know underrepresented in our in our education systems and actually I think sort of to go back to where like Paul's um, sort of talk uh, ended on uh, moments of sort of ambiguity or moments of joy I think I think what is I you know I remember uh, the first time when I went to a sort of project in the UK that was uh, done by Art Angel which is sort of similar a sort of UK production company, which was in an, um, the, the Roundhouse in the um, in the 90s, which is a big uh, train shed, which is now an arts venue, but it was before it had been renovated, and they'd done a sort of they'd filled a whole space with a, a white bouncy castle by an, I think it was by Michael Landy. I had no idea. I was like eight years old. Um, I only discovered this many many years later. But I remember that that sort of surreal moment and that joy that can come with something like that. Um, just the ability to experience the city differently, to feel like it's, yeah, this like open-ended, malleable thing. And as a child, what that feels like. And then when you sort of talk about your projects and um, with the sort of the keys to the city and you're like, you know, there are no concrete outcomes. You're, it's going to be very hard to sort of tick um, a box in a form. But actually, you know, that these things make a difference and they're cumulative. And I think they sort of do enrich all of our experiences of sort of, of, uh, the, sort of the built environment. I mean, I'd say one thing about the kind of gentrification thing. It's a tricky little wicket, you know, in certain cities do feel. I mean, it's. I think it is good to always be strategic in terms of context. And, you know, New York City, for example, is very different than Flint in terms of the speed of urbanism, how much speculative capital is out there for development and stuff. So, I mean, I say that because, like, when we did that Weeksville project, it was really crazy because it was there was a real sad, there's a sad part to that story, which was just that, like, this is in a neighborhood called Beverly Stuyvesant, right near. It's like kind of on the border of Bed Stuy and Crown Heights, and I think it was. It, it's really important to bring up these sites of black <laughs> self determination. But as we were doing community organizing, I mean, everybody in the neighborhood was basically like, "It's a done deal," like, "It's done." Like while we were working with them, um, the place of Josephine English's historic home, the guy who owned the building was just looking for the highest bidder while we're working with them. And while we're, and when Weeksville actually had the city pay for a lead certified giant architectural building, they literally did the ribbon cutting while we were doing the opening of the show and had to fire the entire staff and had a staff of two people. So they had literally brand new computers, you know, state of the art everything. But of course, the city gives no money to actual operating expenses, but they, you know, they pat themselves on the back for helping the civic organization. So, but of course they've got no funding for this organization on an operating level, you know, and so it's just like, but it seemed to me it was almost this structural racism when it, in, in certain kind of hyper-developed moments, it, it, there is a certain, you have to have a certain kind of, um, I don't know what it is. 
it's it felt like that waiting for Godot project. Like you almost have to have an almost epic existential sense of like irony and tragedy at the same time. Because it is hard to confront that kind of shit, man, in the neighborhoods. And like they are who the, the mayors nobody in the city can stand up to it. Like the mayor can't. De Blasio runs on a platform of like, we're gonna stop the developers. You see how that went. So it's like I just think like when an arts organization it's it's a tough thing. And I also don't wanna lie to ourselves about it in certain places. When I worked in North Adams, they wanted gentrification and still do. You know, they're like, hey, I would take any business, you know, and it's a different narrative. So I do think it's important to be contextual about the political economy fights that you're dealing with. Um, and, you know, it's tough for me, too, because like with, with creative time, it's like you want to address these issues, but sometimes I do the math in my head. And there's some really bad math that's coming down, you know. Yeah, sometimes I tell the residents in the area, I'm like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. They're going to come in here and you're going to be gone. This is life. Life isn't fair. This is the truth. So what we do is we shine a light, the brightest light we can, for as long as you're here. And that's all we can do. So we're a bit over time, but I just wanted to ask one last, last quest, question um, to do with your, your book, which is dealing with these, these very hot topics of the way that culture is kind of almost at war with us in our society and um, being being used as a tool of propaganda. And, you know, at the same time, there, there are these forces that are trying to use culture as a form of liberation. And, um, and it's striking in your talking about the, the, the curatorial work at Creative Time, you, one would think that as a, as a social political activist, you would be kind of doing more confrontational work or, or you know, being more, pro, you know, trying to promote more provocations. But actually the way that you're talking about it sounds more like community building and sort of mediation or soft, softening the effect of culture. So can you, can you talk about that? Well, first of all, I got to say, Bernie Sanders almost won, and, uh, and there's no Bernie Sanders without Occupy Wall Street. There's no Bernie Sanders without Black Lives Matter. There's no Bernie Sanders without Standing Rock. So just to say, when people say social movements don't have impact, they totally do. And unlike his, when people say, oh, what do the artists relate to social movements? Everybody, it's all cultural producers in these things now. They're, you know, culture making and social movements are very ingrained, and I say that to go to your point, because I do think the slow work of social building and social, social producing alternative visions of a future is having effects. Like I see it on the, in the political discourse that we are experiencing today. As much as Trump's in office, there is also a very progressive challenge to overarching neoliberal capital that is being articulated globally in country to country to country and and it's it's well long overdue but i think it's important in these moments with trump there to to remind ourselves of some progress you know and i and it's not for whatever you feel about bernie i'm just saying there is a vision that is much more specifically talking about capitalism that says the word socialism that talks about a an ability to combat flagrant speculative money running the world, that is being articulated in a very profound way. And I do credit a lot of this kind of culture, socially engaged do-gooder stuff as a part of the ecosystem that is producing a global collective subjectivity. That is out there. So I think it's okay. You know, it's like Jeff Chang wrote this really great book. I forget what it's called. It's like Who We Be or something. But it's... um. But he kind of talked about culture making like being part of a wave and like no no part no water molecule sees how it plays in the wave, right? But we are all part of a bigger kind of push and it's slower than direct push sometimes. And I think that's okay, because I feel it, you know, I feel it in the I feel it, I feel it in everything, you know. And so I think it's I just I I think it's good to have moments of hope. Cause right now, you know, I think we're all realizing this dude's literally in office for a while. <laughs> All right. Well, on on that note, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks everybody. Thank thank you, Nato, for. for <laughs>